Thank you. My name is Kanan Lipschitz. I'm the Europe correspondent of JTA. JTA is a news agency that is based in New York, and I cover Europe for this news agency that was founded uh, 100 years ago. I zip across <coughs> the European continent, chasing news, finding news, as um, my wife takes care at home of our two small children, and her levels of resentment toward me slowly rise. <laughs> Now, thanks a lot for your trust in giving me uh, a slice of your most precious resource, your free time. Uh, I know I'm billed as this uh, expert on Europe, which I guess I am, but uh, I have to tell you in advance that a large part of what I'm going to be telling you is just the experiences of, uh, of a guy living in, in a neighborhood, pictures, I'm going to show you pictures of people I have barbecue with, my family, my relatives, um, and uh, to make the story of the uh, European jury a little bit more complete. But before you stampede out of here, you know, it's like the guy in the wedding that shows you pictures of his niece, um, I I'm going to throw some statistics at you about uh, European jury, and hopefully arrive at an overview of where we are right now. But before we do, uh, let's define let's define what we uh, mean when we say anti-Semitism. I mean one of three expressions. One is anti-Semitic violence. The other is anti-Semitic <laughs> rhetoric, which is illegal in Europe if it is meant to offend. And three is anti-Semitic sentiment, which is um, difficult to measure, to quantify, but uh, some substantial efforts have been made nonetheless, so we'll be able to, to survey to survey that. Now, in, um, in Europe, in Western Europe, uh, and I'll be focusing on Western Europe because the Eastern part of the continent is a very diff different story. Um, in, in Western Europe, uh, anti-Semitic violence is predominantly perpetrated by people of Muslim origins. In uh, France, the BNVCA, the Bureau de Vigilance contre l'Antisémitisme, a watchdog set up by the Jewish community headed by a former police commissioner, which is fairly credible, uh, estimates that the majority, so at least 51% of all anti Semitic uh, violent acts, are by Arabs, North Africans, and African Muslims. In Holland, the figure stands at 70%, more or less. Um, I'm not going to um, uh, explore anti-Semitic rhetoric very much because what is that? I mean, any Facebook post uh, can be classified as such. So, but I am going to um, survey uh, sentiment. The ADL, the Anti-Defamation Def Defamation League, in 2015 did a comprehensive survey uh, in, in dozens of countries with thousands of interviewees and it boiled down to um, about 74% of the population in the Middle East and Africa, uh, North Africa, so Muslims basically, uh, having uh, anti-Semitic sentiment, and 24% in Europe. Okay, but how does that relate to uh, European Muslims? I mean, these are people who left Africa and the Middle East uh, and are immigration oriented. Uh, they are, um, in many cases, people who are born in Europe because uh, we're talking already about the second and the third generation living here. So it stands to reason that we'll see substantial differences in their level of anti Semitism, given that they grew up in a less anti Semitic society, than their parents. It stands to reason, but unfortunately, uh, this does not <coughs> seem to hold. Uh, survey after survey uh, showed that. In, uh, in, the, in Europe, the middle, people from the Middle East retain more or less the same levels of anti-Semitic sentiment visible in the ADL survey in the Middle East. Two surveys conducted by CRIF, that's the umbrella organization of the French Jewish community, the counterpart of the Board of Deputies, showed 74% anti-Semitic sentiment among Muslim French people, opposed to 25% in the general population. In the Netherlands, the situation is similar. In the UK, <coughs> it is the, the situation is very similar. And the most troubling aspect of this is that this is most visible in the school system. So 
amid the youngest generation, the one we would expect to be most integrated into European society, we're seeing high levels of anti-Semitism, which uh, contributes to a reality, uh, visible here in the uh, right panel, um, that um, in the left panel, uh, in which uh, most, let's put it this way, public education in France has become Jew-free. Almost no affiliated Jew enrolls their children in a public school system. They go to Jewish schools or they go to Catholic schools, which are private in school because of anti-Semitic harassment. In Belgium, the situation is similar. The former leader of the uh, Belgian French-speaking umbrella group of Jewish organizations calls uh, what's happening in, in Belgium a silent exodus. Now, you would think, in light of what I just told you, that, um, but let me ask the question, actually. Who here thinks that, in light of what we just saw, Muslims are more uh, likelier than non-Muslims to espouse anti-Semitic beliefs? So a fair amount of, uh, of people in the crowd, and you're not alone. Georges Ben Soussan is a leading French historian. He's Jewish. He was born in Morocco, and he said in a radio interview in 2014 that Muslims take an anti-Semitism in the mother's milk. Now he was paraphrasing what a uh, Arab filmmaker had said earlier. He said that they take it in the air that they breathe, and he was um, sued by a Jewish human rights group and Muslim lobby group for inciting racial hatred and uh, discrimination. He was eventually cleared of this, uh, of this indictment, but it nonetheless drew to many in academia orders of what's acceptable, what isn't acceptable to say. But this uh, reluctance to face reality that many Jews live day to day goes beyond academia. It has street level expressions. Well, this is uh, returning to academia. This is an astonishing report by the um, French National Board for Fighting Anti Discrimination that found that there is no new anti Semitism in France. New anti Semitism is a definition applied to hatred of Jews with the pretext of Israel, and that, um, in fact, the, it identified perpetrators as being far right to a, to a large degree, and the rest of the crimes that are committed, we don't know. We have no way of knowing who committed the crimes if they're not far right. But on the street, this new anti-Semitism <coughs> Can be seen, uh, can be seen to have deadly effects. Uh, in April 4th, who here has heard of Sarah Halimi? So, for the for the ones who haven't, this is a French Jewish woman, a doctor, and a kindergarten teacher, who on April 4th, at the dead of night, her Muslim neighbor broke into her apartment and pummeled her for about an hour before throwing her to her death from the third story window of her apartment. Uh, he called her Satan, a recording of me of this um, neighbor, uh, and he, uh, he cried Allah Hu Akbar, which means Allah is the greatest in Arabic. And uh, the woman's daughter, Sarah Alimi's daughter, says that a couple of years ago he called her dirty Jew in the stair stairway. Now, this guy was placed under psychiatric evaluation, although he has no history of mental, a mental uh, illness. Uh, he was given an indictment, a draft indictment, that speaks of voluntary manslaughter, so not even murder, with no aggravated element of, uh, of a hate crime. Uh, the French Jewish community gave the judiciary two months of industrial silence, not saying anything, to see if anything changes, and eventually they spoke out and spoke of a cover-up, which is a very serious allegation by a community that has always um, tempted to be very grateful to French authorities for the protection 
it afforded it after the uh, January 2015 killing, murder of four Jews at a kosher supermarket, the French uh, government deployed 12,000 troops nationwide to protect Jewish institutions, synagogues, and schools. And here we have French Jews speaking of a, uh, of a cover-up. This, this blending of hatred toward Jews in Israel that is known as uh, new anti-Semitism is happening across the continent. Um, just for example, today, uh, just about the time that we uh, round up the mood, there will be a march in London, the Al Quds, uh, Jerusalem in, uh, in Arabic, the Al Quds march featuring Hezbollah flags that were sanctioned by the mayor of London. Uh, there are also other expressions of it. Uh, the mayor of Rotterdam uh, in Holland, where I live, recently approved a uh, conference of Hamas, which is believed to be uh, the, the front of Hamas in, in Europe, and then banned a counter-protest by uh, Christians and Jews. Now that's more or less where things stand. To me, I don't know about you, that leaves Jews feeling alone and isolated. Uh, it means that police and authorities are not always on their side despite the best of, uh, of declarations. Uh, and, and we see also in, in politics the uh, remarkable showing of Jeremy Corbyn in the UK signaled to British Jews, uh, Jeremy Corbyn being a man who called Hezbollah and Hamas friends and has had contact with Holocaust deniers and has a very problematic <coughs> history in the eyes of the Jewish community to the degree that the Board of Deputies said that they have no, British Jews have no trust, have no confidence in the labor under Corbyn. A highly remarkable, a highly uh, unusual, sorry, uh, remark uh, because the Board of Deputies, just like here, has attempted to remain apolitical, nonpartisan. Uh, those uh, phenomena show that uh, <coughs> Jews in Europe, basically, don't wield much political power. Their concerns are not taken into account. When Emmanuel Macron, the new president of, uh, of France, rises to power, he doesn't address the issue of uh, Alimi. And it's understandable. He's the head of a huge organization. He doesn't want to upset the police unionists. And by the way, while uh, Sarah Alimi was getting pummeled to death, there were three police officers outside the apartment. Uh, they had been called there by neighbors, but they didn't break in because they suspected, possibly, a terrorist uh, event uh, unfolding. So they called for backup while this woman was being uh, murdered. And that's procedure, but then it begs the question, why is this not being treated as a terrorist attack? In hindsight. But these phenomena leave Jews uh, uh, alienated from the establishments but they do more than that. They give power to the rising far right because the far right is seeing these and other problematic episodes involving Muslims and they're gaining popularity. And that presents its own set of challenges for Jews because the far right want to ban Shechita, want to ban Mila, uh, want to revise the history of the Holocaust. And that leaves European Jews caught in a vice between them far right and the left, uh, with both uh, elements of society gaining force and popularity. Okay, so this has been um, my uh, overview of the problems facing Jews in Europe. Now I want to focus in a little bit final resolution. I noticed you have a lot of space here in, uh, in Australia, you know, big sprawling suburbs. That's not our experience in, in the Netherlands. I want to take you on a bike ride from the Dutch Parliament to a neighborhood of the Netherlands, which is one of Europe's largest Muslim ghettos. It's called the Schilderswijk. It's a place where dozens of women wearing burqas can be seen um, in just a casual stroll. It's a place that had three demonstrations calling for the slaughter of Jews in 2014. It's a place where watching 
a woman with a black eye smoking dope while pushing a pram at 10 a.m. in the morning is not unusual. It's a place where women can't walk with skirts on. It's a place that is partly governed, according to the Dutch media, by Sharia. Uh, I want to take you on a bike ride from Parliament to Schilderswijk. The video that I'm going to show you is sped up two and a half times. So in about three minutes on a bike, you can get from point A to point B. And in the background, you can already see the outline of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is named after the uh, Jerusalem Mosque. And we're in the Schilder's Bank. When cars... I showed you this video to illustrate a point that when cars burn in the Schilder's Bank, you can smell the smoke in Parliament. And uh, cars do have a tendency of burning, of uh, uh, spontaneously combusting in the, in the Schilder's Bank whenever some incident occurs, when there's an altercation, when someone is arrested or, uh, or killed in a fight with police. And that also goes back to why French police were so hesitant to intervene in Saladini's death. Nobody wants that kind of responsibility. This is not anti-Semitism, this is just being pragmatic. No police commissioner wants the responsibility of triggering a second intifada, like the one that happened in France in 2006. Now, I'm showing you this video of the Schildersweig, because the Schildersweig is a place where I lived for three years. Uh, it's not a place that I know theoretically. It's, I've lived these challenges facing many European Jews with my wife. Uh, it's, um, and you might wonder why on earth would I want to move with my wife to Schellersweig, basically a hellhole. Well, um, don't let the $70 jacket fool you. I like cheap stuff. And um, when I was uh, allowed the possibility to rent almost for free in that area in 2010, I jumped on it. Uh, and how come I was allowed the possibility? Well. The Schilderswijk actually stands at the, at the crossroads of European Jewry. It represents our past and future to a large degree. You see, in the 19th century, the Jewish community of the Netherlands bought a housing project inside the Schilderswijk, about 200 apartments. And it did, it, did this because uh, at the time, there was immigration from Eastern Europe, people fleeing pogroms in Russia, in Tsarist Russia, and Ukraine. So it set up this housing project of 200 apartments for poor Jews who came and settled there. And then, uh, almost a century later, in the 1970s, the whole area around the Schilders Bank became an immigrant quarter for laborers coming from Turkey and from Morocco. And the Dutch government to totally tore down the Schilders Bank and built something more appropriate for large families, so housing projects and little play gardens and, and whatnot, but the old Jewish quarter remained unchanged. After the, uh, of course, Hitler took care of the problem of poor Jews. Uh, he killed 75% of the Dutch Jewish population, the highest death rate in Nazi-occupied Western Europe. 
But after the Holocaust, this housing project was given back to the Jewish community. And what they do is they encourage Jews and also non-Jews to move in there because they don't want it to assimilate with the rest of the Schildersweig necessarily. Uh, otherwise, it's also very difficult to get that kind of tenants out once you let them in. So what they do is they give preferential treatment to Jews, Israelis. I was born in Israel, raised in Haifa, uh, and also um, persecuted minorities from Muslim countries. So women who um, got tangled up in honor, honor disputes and uh, needed to flee their homes, uh, Kurds, uh, Yazidis, Christians who had to flee Muslim countries, the Jewish community has made this uh, area available to them. Now, it's a very, uh, it sounds funny to say, but it's a very, very cozy place in the middle of this huge Muslim ghetto. It was like, it is like a little kibbutz. People say hello to each other, and we all had each other's keys, and we watered each other's plants when we were away, and we watched out for one another because it drew interest from the part on the part of the surrounding neighborhood. I'm going to show you a short video of the atmosphere in the uh, in the Jewish enclave. This was my neighbor, a radio journalist. So when I moved there in 2010, I was in heaven. It was great. I had uh, cheap hummus and labane and Syrian olives all around me and nice neighbors. And it was also interesting. I was a journalist, so I was living this uh, exciting episode in, in European history, day to day. But things changed in 2014, which was a crossroads for a watershed moment for European Jewry. Violent protests broke out all over Western Europe. This is a picture from Sarcel, uh, a suburb of, uh, of Paris, northern suburb where um, when Israel was busy fighting Hamas in Gaza, there were <coughs> protests against Israel, and then they morphed into uh, pogromatic bands, I would say. This is the sharp display of the Jewish store. It's said there was a street with uh, many Jewish stores like that, that rioters shattered each and every Jewish store there. Now, when a European Jew sees something like this, we are immediately thrown to think about Kristallnacht. I know this is a, a community with many Holocaust survivors. I know you know um, that the concept is not foreign to you either. Um, these kinds of sites occurred in Europe, never in the volume and prevalence of what happened in 2014. At one event, there were about nine synagogues hit in France during those summer months. At one event at Synagogue de la Moquette, 150 congregants were trapped inside uh, the shore while uh, a few dozen Jewish boys fended off a crowd of 200 riders throwing, well, everything. And there was a shocking video showing it's too low resolution, so I'm not going to project it, but you know, those typical uh, Paris cafe tables being hurled from one side of the road to the other as this group of Jewish guys was, defend, was defending their synagogue. Police was nowhere to be seen. It took them 15 minutes to get there, even though this was a period where such riots broke off demonstrations regularly. Um, so while I was covering this 
all across Western Europe, Paris, Antwerp, uh, Brussels. I came back home to find a similar reality. Uh, the Schilderswijk, like I said, had three protests uh, call, featuring calls to uh, kill Jews. I'm going to show you one. Here. So this is how it typically starts. This is a, a peaceful, illegal, but peaceful demonstration against Israel, God, you know, boycott Israel, all the same slogans, and then it deteriorates into breaking shock displays. In another synagogue in Salsev, when I was walking up that road with the shattered shock displays, I encountered another group of young Jews wielding baseball bats, forming a ring, defensive ring, around their shore, and they were being buffered by police from a group Riders, uh, there was a cloud of tear gas in the air, and at a certain point, spontaneously, the Jews started singing the Marseillaise, the national national anthem, as a token of appreciation for the French police guarding them. As a sort of gesture, we are all in this together. So this is where, this is outside one of those Moroccan uh, supermarkets that I mentioned. Um, coming from <coughs> Paris to this meant that I had nowhere to recharge, nowhere to clear my mind. I felt under attack there and I felt under attack at home. And this really affected my uh, emotional well-being. I was. Um, I think I was scarred by this. At the same time, uh, the harassment of anyone with an European appearance also worsened. Uh, my wife was no longer able to leave the street uh, wearing jeans, and uh, it was really becoming impossible. Uh, one riot broke out when I was walking my uh, neighbor's dog. We were dog sitting, uh, and. I saw bricks starting to fly over. Now, I'm used to this situation from Israel where I served in the army for three and a half years, but when it hits you unprepared at home, it has a very destabilizing effect. And I saw my neighbors in the Jewish enclave starting to change. Um, Vim Korteghoven used to be a senior researcher for the Center for Information and Documentation on Israel the pro-Israel lobby in the Netherlands, if you will. And he joined the far-right Party for Freedom of Geert Wilders. Uh, the trigger for him was watching a car burn in the Skilderswijk. He woke up to the sound of the crackling fire, and he went outside like the rest of us to see what was going on, and he saw this car burning underneath a porch, and there were a lot of people, Muslims, enjoying the bonfire, there was also a family standing on the porch with children. Uh, and then he gesticulated wildly because he was afraid that it will explode, burning the children possibly. So he told them to get the children away. But here was this white guy from the Jewish enclave who came shouting around orders at the Muslims that wasn't seen favorably and they wrestled them to the ground and eventually they were all arrested and the police advise them to move if he wants to uh, avoid the recurrence of such situations. This is another member of the Jewish community uh, participating in a Pegida march uh, against the arrival of immigrants from the Middle East. This is Fabrice Schomberg, another one of our neighbors, and he used to put up the sukkah every, uh, every Sukkot. In the in the hospital, in the Jewish enclave, and we would all come there. We would have Friday, we would have Shabbat dinners, uh, we would have sederim, Pesach sederim. Um, but after 2014, authorities told Fabrice that he can't set up his sukkah anymore for fear of vandalism. Uh, so again, instead of 
preventing violence in areas where police are prevented from, uh, are, are barred from entering because it could result in friction, they crack down on our community, or at least that's how it was seen. Now Fabrice was a, an activist for uh, interfaith dialogue, and he decided after the 2014 riots that he's going to go at it even more um, passionately, and he tried, but eventually he was attacked by uh, a mob of, um, of guys on scooters and beaten up, and he uh, didn't talk so much about interfaith dialogue after that. Now, this is a um, this is a point that I'd like to explore a little bit more depth. The rise of the far right in Europe is seen as a danger to Jewish communities, but at the same time, because of the situation that I just described to you, many more Jews than ever before are subscribing to the opinions of the far right. In um, France, the party of Marine Le Pen, Front National, Marine Le Pen is the daughter of Jean-Marie Le Pen, a uh, Holocaust denier, and she herself said during the elections campaign that France is not responsible for rounding up Jews and sending them to Auschwitz, even though French cops did the actual work. How many seats, how many votes do you think this party got from French Jews? Anyone willing to guess? 50,000. 50,000, yeah. That's uh, not, not so far off base. Uh, mm -hmm. French has half a million Jews, and uh, it got 16%, so more than 50,000. Among Jews, now this may seem little compared to what Front National clinched in the national vote. It had a third of the vote in the May elections. But when Jean-Marie Le Pen ran in the second round of French elections in 2002, he received 18% of the general vote. So seen against that result, French Jews are supporting Marie Le Pen now at about the same rate as the general population 15 years ago. That is astonishing and never seen before. In Holland, the party of Geert Wilders, a politician who said, who promised his voters that they, his country will have fewer Moroccans, substitute Jews for Moroccans, and were right back in the 1930s, he received 10% of the vote, putting him in the third largest party among Jews, way over the Socialist Party, which used to be Bonton in the, in the past. So this, this effect, and I hope that my description of life in the Schilders bag has helped you understand why slogans about the need to stand united against radicalism and the need to uh, heal divisions in society will not work on people who live day to day in this grinding reality. And these are slogans that will be very effective with Jews living in affluent neighborhoods that think about the situation theoretically. But on the ground, it just, it just slides off us like water off a duck, as we say in, in Dutch. It's very difficult. Now, I myself did not become a supporter of the far right. And Vim's story, the guy who joined the uh, Party for Freedom, has a, a large part in that decision. Uh, you see, he left the party after it supported the ban on Shechita, on ritual slaughter. Uh, this party led by a pro-Israel leader who said, uh, often repeats that he stands for Judeo-Christian values, suddenly turned around and supported banning something that is in the fabric of being Jewish in Europe just to uh, spite or to send a message to Muslims. So when his Judeo-Christian values conflicted with his anti-Muslim values, we saw what came on top. We saw where his priorities lay, and that led to him eventually leaving the party. And for many Dutch Jews who recognized that Geert Wilders' is, um, politics may be radical, but they're not based on thin air. They're not uh, empty, empty exaggerations. This turned us off his brand of, of politics. Geert Wilders, by the way, won uh, uh, 
the number two slot, uh, is the second largest party in the Netherlands following the March, March elections. There was another guy called Tai, uh, and he uh, campaigned for the Green Party. He lived in our Jewish enclave. And to him, he kind of, I think, blocked out the whole thing. So he didn't speak about it. <coughs> didn't mind it. And yeah, who goes? Who needs a sukkah anyway? And I'm, I'm explaining about these attitudes because they're representative of how many European Jews deal with, uh, with the challenges we face. I also uh, got married, and I'm going to take the opportunity to show you my wedding video. <laughs> Uh, and uh, as you can see, living with a, uh, a blonde uh, Jewish woman in the Slovak become became impossible. We also had two kids. I didn't want them growing up in this uh, in this environment. So I looked around and we found a nice, quiet neighborhood in uh, northern Amsterdam, and we moved there. And then, just for fun, I looked up the voting patterns in North Amsterdam. Turned out that the Party for Freedom is the largest party in that neighborhood. And recently I was picking up my kid from kindergarten, and um, the kindergarten teacher told me, you do realize we serve uh, meat here? And I said, far out. And then she said, no, but it's not, it's not halal meat. I never said that, I was Jewish and Muslim, but I guess she saw that the kid was circumcised, she put one and one together. Uh, and, and, you know, it was well-intentioned, but it made me wonder whether the new environment to which I brought my child will subject children, will subject them to um, discrimination in the future as they grow up in the school system, in a neighborhood that where xenophobic sentiment is obviously very prevalent. Uh, and that, I think, also illustrates how we are caught between two extremes. Now, what I've outlined here is the, it's a very pessimistic view of, uh, of the death, uh, possible death of European jury, even European tolerance in Western Europe. I don't want to leave you with that uh, impression that this completely encapsulates the Jewish experience in Europe. In Russia, there's been a huge Jewish revival. And people there go with Israeli flags, uh, sorry, Israeli balloons emblazoned with the Israeli flag to celebrate Jewish uh, events. I saw this in Kazan, 800 kilometers east of Moscow. Uh, Spain and Portugal have passed historic laws of return for Jews since 2013. So it's not a it's not a, a uniform picture of gloom and doom. But regarding Western Europe, yeah, there are troubling troubling issues. And yet, as an Israeli, I feel a little bit hypocritical in telling you because what I've done basically is complained that Jews and gays and other minorities cannot live in certain areas in European cities, right? But in Israel, it's not like I could go and move to Shuafat, the Palestinian neighborhood of, uh, of Jerusalem. I get stoned, possibly killed. It's not like my wife can walk with a skirt in the neighborhood. No, she, she get pelted with eggs. So, Perhaps the recipe for coexistence in Europe has to do with compartmentalization. Uh, some would call it ghettoization. I'm not proposing some sort of Judenrat, uh, some Jewish council that will say where Jews can live or can't live, but I'm talking about an organic process in which communities form enclaves with their own uh, norms and rules and uh, unwritten laws, as is the situation in Israel, which I think most of us can agree is a tolerant democratic, democratic state. But this will not happen, even this process will not be allowed to happen painlessly if we don't recognize reality. And that's part of the reason that uh, brought me to give you this lecture. And I have to say a word about Australian jury. As I was participating in Wood Sydney and at this event, uh, a question kept coming back. Why do these people care? I mean, you have every, 
every encouragement, you have a wonderful environment that encourages letting all this go. And yet, you come here and you are, you have a brave connection with Israel and you're totally, uh, the level of knowledge is, is truly astonishing. I think it's, a, uh, it's an inspiring example of how the Jewish bond that connects us transcends political considerations and realpolitik uh, and uh, the need to stick together. So even, even in Europe where we don't have this um, uh, coalescing effect by threats around us, even this is proof that Klal Yisrael Chavarim exists on its own right. So I'd like to thank you for this and for your patience. Jews for what Wilder said about Moroccans, not Muslims, um, is not accurate because Muslims, as, as I've shown, um, themselves harbor uh, values and uh, behaviors that are incompatible with Western ones. Um, Geert Wilders did not offer a critique of Islam when he said that he vows that the Netherlands will have fewer Moroccans. This is, a, and this, is, this is why I singled out this example. This is where the line between criticism on Islam is crossed over to singling out a certain ethnic group. And therefore, I think that in this respect, the uh, comparison does hold. Uh, 